Hello there, everyone. In this module, we'll continue discussing amniotic fluid disorders covering polyhydramnios. Let's begin with a definition. Polyhydramnios, also known as hydramnios, is an excess of amniotic fluid in the gestational sac with an amniotic fluid index greater than 25 centimeters and is associated with an increased risk of various adverse pregnancy outcomes. This occurs when the amniotic fluid index is more than 24 centimeters, which is more than the 95th percentile for the gestational age, and the deepest vertical pocket is more than 8 centimeters. Let's go over the etiology. The most common cause of polyhydramnios is idiopathic, though the most common cause of severe polyhydramnios is severe gastrointestinal anomalies. First, there are fetal anomalies. Congenital fetal malformations, both structural and chromosomal, are associated with polyhydramnios in about 20% of cases. Let's look at swallowing defects in the fetus. One such defect is anencephaly. The features of this include transudation from the exposed meninges, absence of fetal swallowing reflex, and possible suppression of fetal antidiuretic hormone leading to excessive urination. Facial clefts and neck masses can interfere with normal swallowing. Esophageal or duodenal atresia are abnormalities that prevent the swallowing of liquor. A high cardiac output state in the fetus causes more urine output and thus polyhydramnios. Hydrops fetalis, due to rhesus isoimmunization, non-immune hydrops, cardiothoracic anomalies, fetal cirrhosis, and fetal infections with toxoplasmosis, others, for example syphilis and hepatitis B, rubella, cytomegalovirus, herpes simplex, and parvovirus B19 infection are often associated with hydramnios. Here are some other causes. Open spina bifida. This condition is associated with increased transudation from the exposed meninges. Aneuploidy and genetic syndromes. Multiple pregnancy hydramnios are more common in monozygotic twins, usually affecting the second sac. In twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome, the recipient twin develops polyhydramnios. Now for the defects in the placenta. Chorioangioma of the placenta is a tumor growing from a single villus, consisting of hyperplasia of blood vessels and connective tissue, resulting in increased transudation. Next are the maternal defects. Diabetes is more common in hydramnios. In fact, hydramnios is associated with diabetes in about 30% of cases. It's presumed that a raised maternal high blood sugar can potentially raise fetal blood sugar, leading to increased fetal urine production or fetal diuresis, and in some cases, excess amniotic fluid or hydramnios. Cardiac or renal disease may lead to edema of the placenta, leading to an increase of transudation. Polyhydramnios is idiopathic in about 50 to 60% of cases. Let's talk about the symptoms of polyhydramnios. The symptoms are mainly from mechanical causes. As for respiratory symptoms, the patient may suffer from dyspnea or even remain in the sitting position for easier breathing. Other symptoms include palpitation, edema of the legs, varicosities in the legs or vulva, and hemorrhoids. Let's take a look at the signs. The patient may be in a dyspneic state, in the lying down position. Evidence of preeclampsia, including edema, hypertension, and proteinuria, may be present. Now let's learn about the abdominal examination. First, the inspection. The abdomen is markedly enlarged and looks globular with fullness at the flanks. The skin is tense and shiny with large striae. Now for the palpation. The height of the uterus is more than the period of amenorrhea. The girth of the abdomen around the umbilicus is more than normal. Fluid thrill can be elicited in all directions over the uterus. The fetal parts cannot be well defined, so also the presentation or the position. External bolotment can be elicited more easily. 
There may also be auscultation, where the fetal heart sound is not heard distinctly, although its presence can be picked up by Doppler ultrasound. Next, let's go over diagnosis. A physical exam finding a uterine size that is large for the gestational age is suspicious for polyhydramnios. A sonographic visualization of increased amniotic fluid volume that meets either of the following criteria is diagnostic of polyhydramnios. An amniotic fluid index greater than or equal to 24 centimeters, or a single deepest pocket greater than or equal to 8 centimeters. The amniotic fluid index is an estimate of amniotic fluid volume. The uterus is divided into four imaginary quadrants. Here are the criteria for mild, moderate, and severe polyhydramnios. First, the single deepest pocket measurements. In mild polyhydramnios, the single deepest pocket measurement ranges from 8.0 to 11.9 centimeters. In moderate polyhydramnios, the single deepest pocket measurement ranges from 12.0 to 15.9 centimeters. In severe polyhydramnios, the single deepest pocket measurement is greater than or equal to 16 centimeters. Now the amniotic fluid index measurements. In mild polyhydramnios, the amniotic fluid index ranges from 24.0 to 29.9 centimeters. In moderate polyhydramnios, the amniotic fluid index ranges from 30.0 to 34.9 centimeters. In severe polyhydramnios, the amniotic fluid index is greater than or equal to 35 centimeters. Now let's learn about the management of polyhydramnios in singleton pregnancies. First, here's management in polyhydramnios with an identifiable etiology. With guided management, antepartum fetal and maternal surveillance, intrapartum management, and the timing of birth should be directed by specific underlying etiology of the polyhydramnios. With severe symptomatic polyhydramnios, management of maternal symptoms in severe cases is similar to idiopathic polyhydramnios. Now for management in idiopathic polyhydramnios. Management depends on these factors gestational age, severity, and symptoms. Here's how antepartum fetal monitoring is used. In mild to moderate polyhydramnios, perform a biophysical profile, including a non-stress test, upon diagnosis, then again every one to two weeks until 37 weeks pass, and then weekly thereafter. In severe polyhydramnios, Perform weekly biophysical profiles, including a non-stress test, from diagnosis to birth. According to the guidelines of the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, antenatal fetal surveillance is not considered mandatory in mild idiopathic polyhydramnios without other indicators. Now let's go over additional issues. In patients without severe polyhydramnios, typically no intervention is required as severe symptoms are unlikely and no interventions improve pregnancy outcomes. In patients with severe polyhydramnios, if they are asymptomatic or have mild symptoms, no intervention for amniotic fluid reduction is indicated, but for severe shortness of breath or abdominal discomfort, decompression amniocentesis or amnia reduction is suggested to normalize fluid volume. Now for management for patients with preterm labor or frequent uterine contractility. At less than 32 weeks of gestation, prescribe indomethacin for 48 hours to reduce contractile activity and potentially delay birth. At greater than or equal to 32 weeks and less than 34 weeks, other tocolytics may be used. Indomethacin is avoided due to potential adverse effects. At greater than or equal to 34 weeks, tocolytics are not used. An initial course of beta-methasone is considered for pregnancies at risk of preterm birth. Let's learn about amnia reduction, also known as decompression amniocentesis. The procedure is performed under ultrasound guidance with careful fluid removal. Complications occur at low rates, 
but include preterm labor, pre-labor rupture of membranes, abruption, infection, and hypoproteinemia. Next, we'll learn about indomethacin. Its usage is not recommended solely for reducing amniotic fluid. Indomethacin is used in specific cases at less than 32 weeks of gestation with preterm labor or uterine irritability for its combined effects. Now let's talk about labor management. This involves monitoring with frequent checks for fetal position due to excess amniotic fluid and continuous fetal heart rate monitoring. In regards to membrane rupture, prophylactic amnioreduction may be considered during labor to prevent complications. Let's go over the timing of delivery. In mild to moderate polyhydramnios, induction at 39 plus zero to 40 plus zero weeks is recommended. In severe polyhydramnios, induction at 37 plus zero weeks is advised to minimize risks. Earlier delivery may be considered based on symptom severity and response to amnioreduction. Now we're going to talk about the management of idiopathic severe polyhydramnios. Severe polyhydramnios is defined as an amniotic fluid index greater than or equal to 35 centimeters or a single deepest pocket greater than or equal to 16 centimeters. Severe symptoms can be defined as significantly interfering with the patient's ability to conduct the normal activities of daily life. Amnioreduction relieves symptoms immediately, but amniotic fluid may reaccumulate within a few days to weeks. Intervention to reduce amniotic fluid is not indicated in asymptomatic patients or patients with mild shortness of breath, abdominal discomfort, and or uterine irritability that is reasonably tolerable. Let's take a look at the complications. The complications of hydramnios are grouped into maternal, during labor, puerperium, and fetal. First, the maternal complications. During pregnancy, there is an increased incidence of preeclampsia seen in 25% of cases, premature rupture of the membranes, and accidental hemorrhage malpresentation and persistence of floating head, preterm labor, either spontaneous or induced. Next are the complications that occur during labor. These include early rupture of the membranes, cord prolapse, uterine inertia, retained placenta, postpartum hemorrhage, and shock, increased operative delivery due to malpresentation, now for the complications during puerperium. These include subinvolution and increased puropural morbidity due to infection, resulting from increased operative interference and blood loss. Lastly, here are the fetal complications. There is increased perinatal mortality to the extent of about 50%. The deaths are mostly due to prematurity and congenital abnormality, accounting for 40% of cases. Other contributing factors are cord prolapse, hydrops fetalis, the effects of increased operative delivery, and accidental hemorrhage. Thank you for listening to this module covering polyhydramnios.